All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, Strategies for Teaching Clinical Skills with Aquifer. My name is Megan Hotelling, and I'm the Community Engagement and Event Manager here at Aquifer. So today I'd like to start off by introducing our presenters and panelists. With us today, we have Amit Shaw, Kelsey Doherty, Shannon North, and Pete Bredinger. They're here today to share um, their stories with you on teaching clinical skills. So here's the agenda for today's webinar. So we're going to conduct a quick poll in the chat before moving on to the presentation, where we'll hear from a panel of educators on the common challenges um, to teaching clinical care, some possible strategies, and then get to hear their teaching stories on how, and how they use Aquifer. And then we'll end it with a Q&A with these expert educators. All right, so let's start with a quick poll to get us warmed up a little bit. Um, in the chat, I would like you to tell us today um, some of the challenges you're facing with teaching clinical care skill or teaching clinical skills, or what brought you to the webinar today. So if you can go ahead and pop pop something in the chat, that would be great. Oh yeah, Matt just notified us, make sure everyone is selected so we can all see your answers. Here they come, perfect. All right, learning new tips and tricks for teaching clinical courses, I love that. Faculty development credit, that's great. Um, <clears throat> we use Aquifer, but not for using clinicals per se, so we'd like to learn more, awesome. That's awesome. So if the question, if your questions don't get answered during the presentation piece today, we have time at the end for a Q&A with our panelists. So feel free to keep using the chat um, and I'm going to keep us rolling. So just a few logistics to note, like I mentioned, feel free to continue to use the chat for dialogue with one another and the panelists. Um, and if you have any questions, there is a specific button for Q&A. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting those questions into the Q&A section, that'll help us keep track of everything. And then we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. And I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Amit Shah. Hi, everyone. It's great to meet with you today. Um, my name is Amit Shah. I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs at Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine. I'm an internal medicine physician and a geriatrician. Uh, and I was also formerly a clerkship director, and I've been involved with Aquifer for, for, for many years, first as a case editor for the internal medicine curriculum, and, uh, and then in Aquifer Geriatrics as the editor-in-chief and now senior director. Um, and uh, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, how you can use Aqua for teaching for teaching clinical skills. Now, it might seem quite obvious, uh, you know, like why do we have to have a webinar about teaching clinical skills with Aquifer? Isn't that what Aquifer is all about? And and though that is true, um, there are some really creative ways in which um, uh, clinical skills can be taught, uh, and where you can actually operationalize the use of Aquifer cases in ways that are a lot of fun and and more. Uh, acceptable to our students as a part of their day-to-day uh, -day in, the, in the clinic or in the hospital. Um, so, you know, why, why use Aquifer for teaching clinical care? I mean, obviously, we'd all love to be able to do this in a high-quality way and just teach with patients every day and have a wide variety of patients and have a perfectly set up clinic schedule or hospital schedule where a student gets exposed to every single problem in medicine. But we all know that that's just not feasible, no matter where we work, what patient population we serve. There's always holes and gaps um, in uh, uh, the education of our students. And how do you standardize this? Um, and, and, and I think that's the, probably the most important thing that Aquifer provides when you're using it for clinical skills is a standardized experience where you know that for sure our students are going to get these problems and taught in this way. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what rotation they're on, whether they get to see a geriatric patient or a pediatric patient, I know that at least they'll get it in a virtual way through the cases. Um, the other thing that is really hard in the busy pace of clinic, I'm an outpatient doctor now, and I, but I've done inpatient medicine also, but the outpatient clinic, there's a rapid pace, and you may have this great teaching item that you want to do 
uh, but you don't have time because the next patient's still waiting in the clinic. Uh, and the same thing is true in the hospital. There are sick patients and everyone's attention on the sick patient. There may be a great teaching point on another patient, but you just don't have time to cover it during rounds um, or, or during care. So, um, so what Aquifer allows is for patients, uh, for students to be self-paced as they go through things. Um, and it provides really nice uh, feedback to students as they do the cases, you know, with both um, formative assessment questions, summative assessment questions, um, and a way to, for them to really consolidate knowledge in a way that gives them immediate feedback. Um, um, and it takes a huge teaching burden off of faculty. So we'll, we'll hear about some ways in which aquifer cases can be used to uh, prime the pump or to really um, get students the basic knowledge that they need before they enter a clinical environment or, or how you can teach unique parts of clinical skills using aquifer. Um, so, uh, and so hopefully today's webinar will be useful for you in that way. So um, you, you may all know this, but aquifer is really, if you think of it, uh, 200 virtual patient cases, more than 200 of them. And, and almost all the cases walk students through the history, the physical exam, the differential diagnosis, the treatment, the management, and, and oftentimes summarizing all that has happened in the case um, and giving them some great teaching points. Um, and so every single one of these aspects of the patient encounter can be emphasized or taught uh, uh, depending on how you implement the aquifer cases. So what are some strategies that you can use uh, to uh, teach uh, aquifer cases? Um, so there's the obvious, which is just assigning them, uh, but that's probably the least effective compared to what you could do. Um, some faculty have said, I want you to do this case, and then I want you to write a note um, uh, uh, and submit it to me as if you had seen this patient in clinic. Uh, write a self note or a progress note um, uh, that you might, might have written. Um, uh, this is a great way uh, where you can have a few minutes to discuss the differential diagnosis or your teaching pearls. So the faculty member can know the case, have the student do the case, but not have to teach every single teaching point, but then debrief about the case. Um, there's nice ways for them to submit the summary statements that they might write, um, um, and you can explain to them why this is really important uh, to write a crisp statement that explains what's going on with that patient. Such an important part of communicating as a resident or calling in a consult, um, et cetera. Uh, some people have implemented aquifer cases where um, students work together um, and they provide feedback to each other on their summary statements um, or the or the, the case product. Um, uh, aquifer cases have been used uh, to teach handoffs, you know, so, okay, you took care of this patient. Um, now, uh, imagine that you have to give sign out to somebody about this patient because you're going off service or you're the night team and you're giving sign off to the day team, um, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and if you know that there are certain conditions that you always see in clinic, and there's some really basic teaching that you need to get and make sure that the students have before they come into that clinical experience, it's a wonderful way to teach them, quote unquote, priming the pump, you know, so if you're a family medicine physician, um, having them do some of the cases on preventative care so that they know the basics of what's required for preventative care, and you don't have to go over USP, STF guidelines, et cetera, um, and then when they come to clinic, you can expect that they've already known this because they've done those four or five cases uh, that you have found that are important to your clinical practice. Um, and then there's a whole host of very creative ways, some of which we'll hear about today, um, that may fit the needs of your school, of your local clinical environment, um, that can really make teaching efficient, fun, um, and ensure that every student is getting a core set of topics. So, uh, uh, we're going to hear a lot more of these sort of teaching stories from our educators today. Um, and so I'd like to uh, turn it over to Kelsey Doherty uh, from the University of Colorado, who's going to start with uh, the way that they have used Aquifer in their institution. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to Aquifer for inviting me to participate in this webinar. My name is Kelsey Doherty, and I'm a physician assistant and an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Child Health Associate Physician Assistant Pro Program, also called CHAPA. And I'm going to spend just a minute um, explaining our curriculum a little bit as it helps to really understand where we're utilizing aquifer cases within the curriculum. So we are a three-year program. We have two, year, two years of didactic training and one year of clinical rotations but our students actually go out on clinical rotations starting in the spring of their first year as well. 
We are a spiral curriculum and we updated our curriculum back in 2018. So I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And all of our curricular content is centered around clinical presentations. So things like chest pain, abdominal pain, all of the topics that the students learn in that week are really centered on that topic. And we have dedicated case time every single week in our didactic curriculum, which is really where the aquifer cases come into play. So this is just a screenshot of our Colorado curriculum, the two-year didactic phase of the curriculum. So our first year students start in a summer immersion or kind of an introductory course, and then they move through a series of organ-based blocks or courses, as we call them, that anywhere span from three to five weeks at a time. And the spiral nature of our curriculum is that they come back to those same organ-based blocks in their second year. So we revisit some of the concepts, but go at a higher level for our second year students. We also have courses called threads that as the name kind of implies, they thread throughout the two years of the didactic program and they occur one to two times a week. And that's where the students learn some of the skills like soap notes, oral presentations, and how to do a physical exam, as well as some prevention and advocacy topics. And then our students are out in clinical rotations starting in the spring of their first year as well. So this is kind of a snapshot of uh, one of our GI based block course for our first year students. So the clinical presentation for this week is abdominal pain. So as I mentioned earlier, all of the concepts the students learn are centered on that topic of abdominal pain. So they learn about the anatomy of the abdomen, physiology, they learn the abdominal exam, they have some clinical medicine lectures. And then here is where they have dedicated case time that really tries to pull together all the topics they've learned in that week, sometimes prior weeks, sometimes prior months. And this is where, where we really utilize our aquifer cases, especially for our second year students. So how do we use aquifer cases specifically? We use them for a lot of different things, but really for reinforcement of medical knowledge. So having the students get a deeper dive into a topic maybe they've learned earlier in that week. They're really wonderful for teaching the students and kind of honing their clinical reasoning skills. And what I'm going to focus on today is how we use them to have the students really practice their focused physical exam. So the learners really work through the aquifer case independently, followed by a debrief with the entire class that's led by a content expert. And this is where during the debrief portion, the students actually get into pairs and practice the physical exam on each other. And that gets kind of discussed in a little bit more detail. So I'm gonna actually show an example of a case that we use in the second year um, during the musculoskeletal neurology block um, that's a specific aquifer case. So this aquifer case, it's family medicine number 11. It's a 74 year old female coming in with knee pain um, presenting to her primary care clinic. And so again, we use this case for our second year learners that are in their musculoskeletal um, course. So they're really learning a lot of these topics um, that week. And this is happening during their dedicated Thursday case time. So as you can see in the screenshot here, the first part of the case really focuses on kind of the history, the students are given the chief complaint, what is the patient presenting with, and this ends up being an osteoarthritis case. But the case walks the students through the history, the pertinent exam findings, and then as you can see here, provides a really robust section on clinical reasoning and helps the students work through a differential diagnosis based on kind of the signs and symptoms. So this is actually a two-part case. So after you, the students work through the knee pain portion, um, the patient actually comes back in the case um, to the same clinic for ongoing right wrist pain. And this is where we actually have the students practice the focused physical exam. So once they've gone through the case independently on their own, they get into pairs and actually do a focused physical exam on each other, given this chief complaint. And during the debrief portion, the facilitator really leads a discussion on kind of the nitty gritty of all the elements of the focused physical exam and ask some kind of pointed questions to the learners to generate some discussion about how did the learner decide which exam elements needed to be performed? How did each exam element and the finding of that exam element either support or refute the learner's hypothesis on what they thought was going on with the patient? 
And were there any special specific tests um, or special tests, I'm sorry, that were performed and why? Why did the student choose to do those? During this time, there are also facilitators that walk around the class and observe the students practicing these exams on each other to really see, are they doing the correct technique? Do they know what they're doing? Uh, the students learn this exam actually in their first year. And so this is revisiting and kind of reinforcing those topics in their second year as they work through this case. So just some kind of closing tips and pearls. We really feel that aquifer cases are robust. We utilize them for our more intermediate or advanced learners, which I think is, is recommended. Um, those students really have some pretty good clinical medicine foundation, and they've had some patient care exposure already. So we use this in our second year students, but I think third year students or students in clinical rotations would also be very appropriate. Third, fourth year medical students or even residents, um, I think could absolutely work through these with very little assistance from faculty. We also feel the debrief of the case is pretty critical um, to ensure that there's appropriate understanding by the, the learners of the case concepts. And we try to have these debriefs run by content experts whenever possible. So sometimes that's a faculty member. I have a background in infectious disease. So I've led a case um, on like a septic arthritis, or we had like a neonatologist come in and run a case on neonatal jaundice. Um, standardization of the case debrief we've also found has been really critical. Um, every facilitator has a different background um, and all the cases are certainly quite unique, but if the students kind of come to expect similar things in the case debrief, um, we have found that that has been really beneficial. And then finally, this really, these cases challenge the students to really think outside the box and avoid anchoring. They're very realistic cases. They can be very challenging and it really helps the students build on topics that they've learned maybe earlier in that week or maybe even a year ago, um, but really challenges them to think broadly um, just like a clinician would. So I'm gonna hand it over next to my colleague, um, Shannon North. Hi everyone, I am Shannon North. I am a clinical associate professor at Pace University Lenox Hill Hospital's Physician Assistant Program in New York City. I have been a full-time faculty member here at this PA program for about eight years, and we have used Aquifer throughout our curriculum for that entire time that I've been here. Um, we mainly, our program, use Aquifer during the clinical year. We have roughly 80 clinical students and we utilize Aquifer to help us augment uh, learning outcomes addressed by our skippies and an assessment of student, students in a myriad of different ways. We use it for flipped classroom activities. The students will do a Aquifer virtual patient case and then we'll come back into the classroom to discuss. We use Aquifer um, to assess written documentation um, and in written documentation instruction throughout the clinical year. Uh, we find this specifically or uh, especially helpful during their surgery rotations. Um, the students a lot of time are in um, surgery the, the entire time during their rotations and they do very brief surgical progress notes, which is a great skill to learn as well. But if we want to assess a more SOAP note um, and you know, encounter, we will do, um, have the students do a virtual patient case through aquifer related to a surgical technique, and then we will um, address the, that soap note. We also, um, we were in New York City during the start of COVID, so we did have to take a brief pause from our skippies, and during that time, we used aquifer virtual patient cases to do remote faculty guide and rounds, and then that evolved into, currently, we use it to uh, use virtual patient cases in our assessment of oral presentation skills. We found this very helpful because we were able to, um, as faculty, do a virtual patient case, understand what the case entails. And then when the students do the case and present to us, we're able to have a more rigid rubric and really know exactly what they should be including in their oral presentation. So that's been very helpful. And today what I'm gonna to talk about in particular is how we utilize Aquifer in our remediation during the clinical year. So like many other programs, our students do seven core clerkships, and then they have two other clerkships that are usually a surgical or medical elective. Um, they do clerkships in internal medicine, pediatrics, women's health, behavioral medicine, family medicine, emergency medicine, and surgery. 
and we use Aquifer to augment our learning outcomes in all of these different courses. And today I'm going to be talking in particular about how we use it for remediation. So we one big way we use Aquifer in our clinical year that we have found to be very helpful is use it using the virtual patient cases to come up with individualized clinical exam remediation. So ARCPA, so our accrediting body, uh, standard B401 states that the program must conduct frequent, objective, and documented evaluations of student performance and meeting the program's learning outcomes and instructional objectives for both didactic and supervised clinical practice experience components. So those are the skippies. It goes even further to say that these evaluations must allow the program to identify and address any student deficiencies in a timely manner. That timely manner can be very difficult during the clinical year, as many programs probably um, encounter this. Our students will do different rotations at different times. They're all in different rotations, and they may have an end of rotation exam in internal medicine on a Friday and then start an OBGYN rotation the next Monday. So identifying any issues that a student may have in the internal medicine in a rotation exam on that Friday in a very timely manner is not only important because it's an ARC standard, but also very important because our students need to then focus on the next rotation that they have. Um, OBGYN in my example. So we have found utilizing the virtual patient cases through Aquifer really helpful in um, addressing and identifying um, and remediating in a, in a timely manner during the clinical year. A specific example of how we do this is our program uses PAEA end of rotation exams and um, that give a PAEA end of rotation exam performance report. And um, in that performance report are feedback by keyword that identify areas that of weakness that need to be addressed in a remediation. If your program didn't use, doesn't use PAEA end of rotation exams, you could use um, your program test mapping to identify areas improvement as well. So they give you a very clean um, printout that has feedback by keyword, and we're able to quickly look at this feedback. And given our knowledge of aquifer cases, I usually pick you know around three cases that will aquifer virtual patient cases that will address um, these areas that are in need of improvement, and quickly assign them to the student for remediation. So this can be done you know, on a Friday, I get the scores, I come up with the individualized remediation, send it out to the students, and then they can retest you know, that next week if appropriate. Um, this allows for remediation in a timely manner. It also allows the student to be able to do the remediation um, at home and at their own time, which is very helpful during the clinical year because all the students are on different rotations and have very different schedules. Um, so this has been very useful in our remediation of the actual exams during the clinical year. And then we also have utilized the virtual patient cases to remediate clinical reasoning errors. So our program does simulated cases in our uh, lab throughout both the didactic and clinical year. And in particular, there was a simulated case where it was actually a standardized patient case that was a patient with past medical history of asthma complaining of uh, acute shortness of breath. So what we did is we noticed that many students immediately diagnosed this, you know, patient with acute asthma exacerbation without considering other differential diagnoses, um, you know, doing the appropriate OPQRSTs or asking the appropriate review of systems. And so we noticed that during the clinical year, this fast paced clinical year, the students are out on rotations, we needed to address and remediate a large number of students because of this deficiency and um, their clinical reasoning. So in the past, what we would have done is reschedule a lab time, which not only takes a lot of faculty resources, but also time um, because the lab is scheduled so far in advance, a lot of times then they can't do this remediation until far, not in that within that timely manner. Um, so instead we use Aquifer and chose a virtual patient case with a similar scenario where the patient ultimately had a, a PE. And um, this was very helpful. And then the students were able to review the video of their SP encounter. And then they also um, had a guided written reflection on cognitive error and biases. Um, so once again, like uh, the remediation for our end of rotation exams, 
this can be done in a very timely manner. The students also, the clinical students could do this remediation and these aquifer virtual patient cases at home on their own time. So if they were working nights, if they were working weekends, um, scheduling them in person wasn't that issue here, which sometimes it is during the clinical year. Um, so I, you know, cannot express how useful Aqua has been in enhancing and strengthening our assessment tools during the fast paced clinical year. I hope some of these ideas for mediation have been helpful and I will be available during the Q&A to answer any questions. Hello everyone, it's good to be back again here. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our experience at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine, uh, Arizona's campus, um, but also across all of our medical schools. So a little bit more about our school, which we like to call Mick Awesome. Uh, we're a three campus medical school in three states and three time zones. So it's, it's you can only imagine the challenges of trying to infuse a geriatrics curriculum uh, into, uh, into this sort of a, a setting. Um, we have no dedicated geriatric clerkship or rotations, uh, but we did have a course called Senior Sages, which we've had for a number of years, which is a senior mentor focused uh, program uh, where each of our students get a community dwelling senior and they have a four year relationship with them. And it, things worked really well in the preclinical time uh, where they would have frequent meetings and learn about things like stereotype busting about older people and functional status and advanced directives. But it was really weak during the clerkship and clinical years because not every one of our mentors could teach every clinical topic based on their own experiences. And so we had a goal of trying to teach the national geriatric competencies for medical students. And we had the challenge of how are we going to do this without any additional time and in, and in three different states um, uh, with some uniformity um, and, and confidence that we were achieving the learning objectives that we sent out. So uh, like all of the other uh, aquifer uh, courses, uh, our aquifer geriatrics is tied to these national competencies. And in geriatrics, they're called the 5M competencies, which you can access by looking at, by using this QR code or going to the tiny URL that's on the slide. And the five Ms are mind, mobility, medications, what matters most, and multi-complexity. And, and these are uh, about 27 um, uh, objectives that we hope that our students will all have by the time that they graduate. So how do we figure out, like, how are we gonna do this at our, at our, at our school? Um, and it was really Aquifer that came to the rescue here. Um, and so we created a model, we call it the three Ms to teach the five Ms. So every single one of our clerkships is now linked to one of these 5M domains of the mineral and geriatrics competencies. Then the students do modules, the second M, which is uh, which we which was really feasible because we can we can assign them to students. It's the same across campuses. They're asynchronous. One person on one clerkship, one person on another. No big deal. They get them all by the end of the year, um, and uh, and so they do the modules. But we knew that we couldn't let that just be in isolation. We needed to let that learning from the modules be tied into their clerkships and so that we weren't the standalone extra assignment that they had to do, that it was actually linked to their clerkship objectives and to clerkship learning. And so we created a passport, a skills check off essentially. It's a virtual thing that they do on our learning management system. Uh, and, and I'll give you a couple of examples to show you what this means. So how do we do it? First of all, it's like, what well, case am I gonna apply to what clerkship? So the nice thing for the geriatrics uh, course is that um, our teacher tells you this, so you don't have to figure this out. So if you go to the teacher's guide and say, okay, I wanna figure out what I can do in OBGYN, you go to table eight, page eight of the table, and this is a little snippet of it, and you say an OBGYN, oh, it looks like case three would be a perfect one to assign for OBGYN, let me look at that one. So that's what we did. And here's how we implemented an OBGYN. We said, okay, in OBGYN, uh, we want to focus on multi-complexity, the care of the older female patient, especially with conditions that they might see an OBGYN for, like urinary incontinence and urinary tract infections. There were two cases, three and 18 for that. So we assigned those modules. The message is linked to the competencies, the national competencies, 13 and 22, um, the aging bladder and urinary incontinence. And then we tied it into some mastery. So when you go to clinic, uh, either examine an older patient, learn how to do a pelvic exam in an older person. If you don't see an older person, then talk with your faculty about tips about making a pelvic exam comfortable for somebody with severe hip arthritis who's 90 years old, et cetera. Um, and then discuss urinary incontinence and the types of urinary incontinence um, after you've done the case with your preceptor. Um, and so that's the way we did an OBGYN. In family medicine, we took a different approach. 
with the mastery, uh, but the message issues were the same. We linked in this one to four different competencies, medications and medication reconciliation, and then a lot around screening decisions, prognosis decisions, and individualizing treatment, which were three different competencies um, in the five M's. Uh, and, and this all fell under matters most. Um, and so the two cases they do is a great one on prognosis and screening, which talks to them about how you make decisions, about when to order that colonoscopy in 80 year old or not. Um, and then frailty, you know, how, when you decide and how do you figure out whether someone's too frail uh, for a certain uh, tests or screening um, and, and or needs end of life care discussions. Um, and so those were the modules. Um, and then the mastery was with their senior sage. So we tied it back to that experience with their senior sage, their mentor, um, and they discussed with that person their preventative care views, their prognostication uh, uh, views and what matters most to them. Um, and then they write a reflection essay. So a little bit different than the OBGYN experience, but still you can see tied into the modules um, and to the competencies. So in summary, you know, uh, what uh, our Mick Awesome experience has been is that Aquifer has enabled us to really create a geriatrics infused clinical curriculum uh, without any extracurricular time um, and with great reception from our students. We now have uh, geriatrics content at, content at every single one of the required clerkships, minus pediatrics, of course, uh, in emergency medicine, uh, which is a fourth year clerkship, and in our fourth year sub I. And then we allow our students to do three additional cases that they self-direct based on their residency uh, choices. Uh, so to really tie it into lifelong learning and, and to make it more appealing to them. So our students now get 16 aquifer cases in geriatrics over the clinical years. And we thought initially there would be a lot of pushback, but because we were intentional, because the quality of the aquifer cases, the, the, the brevity of them, they, they really felt like it taught them something that was linked to their clerkships. And we've had no complaints after our implementation of this curriculum. It also has standardized the experience across three states, three campuses, um, and, uh, and it's been really easy to track. We can look very clearly uh, in aquifer, have our students done their cases um, and, and remind them to, to make sure that they've done it. Um, and then we track the passport with the, our learning management system with the checkoffs. And so the combination of those two things, we, we know who's doing their work and who has not. Um, and so that's our experience. I'd be happy to answer more questions during the Q&A. And now let's turn it over to Peter Breitinger, uh, who's from the University of Florida College of Medicine to hear their experience. Hi, my name is Pete Breitinger. I'm assistant professor with the School of Physician Assistant Studies at the University of Florida College of Medicine. I'm also a member of the Aquifer PA Task Force. A little history of our program. Uh, the program was established in 1972. We are a master's level degree and have a total of about 120 students, 60 in the didactic year and 120 in the clinical year. Our core rotations include primary care, pediatrics, internal medicine, women's health, surgery, psychiatry, emergency medicine, and critical care medicine. So how do we use Aquifer within the uh, clinical year um, with our students? We utilize the cases to enhance student communication and, and writing skills by creating, having them create soap notes from their cases. The students uh, evaluate the case for clues to distill into a, a soap note. It's very much similar to the case analysis tool in the pediatrics education educator resources section. And what we have found is that it really helped to keep the basic skills fresh for our students. So the faculty grade the SOAP notes utilizing a rubric. They were initially, we blinded them to the case as if this were an actual uh, patient note that the students saw on clinical rotation. Uh, this method was primarily used uh, during the pandemic um, for to supplement patient students' patient experiences when the students were unable to see patients or patient logs reflected deficits in certain patient populations, particularly not seeing enough patients across the lifespan. This is one of our accreditation standards um, that we, we need to ensure that we fulfill on all rotations. So this is an example of the SOAP note rubric that we utilize. I, I realize most programs have probably created their own, but the particular areas that we focus on uh, of course, is the main HPI review of systems, the medications and allergies, the past medical history, obviously, if it's relevant to be placed within the SOAP note or not, uh, physical exam, 
um, and then focus more so into how the student's critical thinking is, is assessed with problem identification and prioritization, their assessment and clinical reasoning, and then finally their plan and patient education. Um, we also give them points for the overall note style for grammar, spelling, et cetera, um, and how the, the flow of the, of the note is. Um, and I suggest that with the aquifer cases that you might develop your own rubric based on the, on the specifics of that case to guide faculty to go through and grade it a little bit more objectively. I would also consider having faculty review the case synopsis for salient points before grading. I think one thing that we did find is, is that faculty, even though they, were, they may have been blinded to the case, um, seemed to miss out on some of the details that might have uh, lent itself from the case itself. The other caution I would have as well is, is about students using the summary statements and plagiarizing components. So if there's a way to kind of block that out from them being able to see that, or at least having familiarity, you know, that they're not, they're not plagiarizing uh, from that, that area. So other uses uh, that our program has found uh, that's benefited us using Aquifer is for students that uh, require remediation or have missed uh, several days on their from their clinical rotation, we'll assign cases to them to help supplement their uh, patient experiences and learning. We'll also use it for identifying deficits noted on evaluations and, and particularly uh, identify aquifer cases that will, will help increase their learning as well. One thing that we have done uniquely is take some of the cases and modify them into problem-based learning exercises, uh, which has uh, worked out very well and has been uh, fairly easy to do. Finally, we also um, use it to enhance our learning outcomes or our EPAs, our entrustable uh, professional activities that we have assigned as learning outcomes within the clinical year. Uh, for instance, obtaining a history and physical. If we have students that are still uh, showing deficits from their evaluations um, or exams, we will assign cases specific to have them kind of, you know, remediate or learn more about history or their physical exam skills as well. And then we will further test them later with uh, standardized patients and such. Uh, finally, we also uh, use Aquifer for our elective modules, which are based on pharmacologic uh, understanding of uh, certain uh, disease states and medicines, for instance, cardiology or infectious disease. And uh, as part of the module, the Aquifer cases lend itself really well to their further understanding of that. So we really appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, utilize Aquifer, and it really benefits our program in so many different ways. Uh, I'd like to now uh, open it up, though, to our Q&A. So thank you. All righty. Just uh, asking all of our participants, if you're able to, to go ahead and uh, throw things into the chat or into the Q&A box, either way, whichever way you, you feel comfortable. Uh, and... Uh, I'll start off with the, some of our uh, the questions that have been asked. We had some that we received by email, uh, but uh, but I think there's been a question just about teaching the uh, clinical reasoning. Um, Kelsey, do you want to talk a little bit about clinical reasoning and um, the decision making and how do you beef up those skills? That's oftentimes the hardest thing for us to teach as clinicians. Yes, absolutely. So I you know think the way that we modified our curriculum back in 2018, as I kind of mentioned, we really wanted to have this dedicated case time to pull together these clinical reasoning concepts for our students and really prepare them as they enter their clinical year. Because we're a two-year didactic program, they get a lot more time in the classroom. So we really wanted to ensure that are these students really thinking like a clinician and are they ready to think like a clinician before they enter their, their clinical year? And I think the aquifer cases have really helped us with that. Um, you know, the students sit in on these lectures, you know, I help run the musculoskeletal course. So they sit in on a two hour lecture on chronic joint pain, and they kind of learn all these different diseases. And by really working through the aquifer case on a patient with osteoarthritis, it really helps the students start to think like a clinician, think through their differential diagnosis. And I think it's a springboard for these content experts to come in and really take a deeper dive on those concepts using this patient case as kind of an anchor 
Um, and I think we've really seen our students improve um, in those skills in the last couple of years that we've used those cases. Fantastic. Yes, yeah, so we always talk about that black box, you know, student sees a clinician look at something and be like, it's this and you're like, what happened in there? And what Aquifer is so good is, is letting the student into the brain of an experienced clinician. And I think um, that is really and, and to do it in a slow way that they can get get. And I think that that's that's great. Um, I, a, a, any uh, Shannon or, or, or Peter, do you have uh, anything else to add to that about clinical reasoning before we move to the next question? So um, I think uh, another method I was I actually I was going to start using uh, uh, this upcoming spring with with our uh, new class was we have a course called differential diagnosis and the illness scripts that have just recently uh, come out really lend itself very well to start getting them through that process of critical thinking. But not only that, but to also kind of bringing back some of that that initial knowledge that you know they pretty much go through that run of like I learned it I dumped it and I won't have to do it again and it helps to kind of remind them again how important it is and how integral it is by working through those illness scripts as well so yeah that how that all comes together hopefully very well I'm sure um I was going to respond to one of the questions about recommending doing a case debrief um uh, during with while students are on different clinical rotations I, my personal approach, um, especially with aquifer cases as well, is um, we have advisor meetings every time they, they come back. So using a specific case, you know, for all the students, regardless of what rotations there are, they're, they're on, you know, it's going to benefit them and, and everyone no matter, no matter what, right? I mean, because they're all going to have to learn that information at some point in time. So you can mix it up to, if you have frequent advisor meetings or so, or small groups, you know, having a different case based on the, the rotation. So one month, maybe women's health, another month, a pediatrics case, et cetera. Um, and going off of kind of what Shannon was saying too, you might collectively look at, you know, the class as a whole from their EORs, where are some of the deficits that you're noting on, you know, their, their EOR skills and such, or their, their EOR uh, keywords and find a case that is gonna be relative to most everyone for that too. And just to add to that, we do something a little different. We actually, our angel rotation is a course. So we assign different aquifer cases depending that are specific to the, the course that they're in or the rotation that they're on. So that helps as well. So they, instead of reviewing it with their advisor, they would review it for the course instructor doing surgery related cases, women's health related cases and whatnot. Um, and at, uh, at Mayo, one of the way, I didn't talk about it in, in my presentation, but we use the advanced directive case, case 27. And you know, teaching about advanced directives, what's the medical power of attorney, what's this, what's that, it's terribly boring, right? But they need to know that language to be able to have a higher level of discussion. And so rather than use the hour that we have to discuss um, goals of care and advanced care planning, we have them do that case, which goes through all the definitions and the basic knowledge so that, and then they've met with their senior mentor, their sage and have discussed it. So then our debrief now, really went up from what it used to be before we used to use the case because it used to be answering questions about what an MPOA is and then it was like what do you do when you don't have any children and don't have a you have your lawyer as your MPOA how does that work you know so it ended up being much more engaging of a conversation in our small groups so that's the way we've done it is um, to have all the faculty uh, running those sessions know what uh, what pre-knowledge is there so they don't repeat it is very important um, and then uh, we assign, uh, 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 I didn't speak about this, but we use the aquifer cases with our residents also. Um, we have all of our internal medicine residents who are in, in their first year rotate through geriatrics. And uh, the uh, prognosis and screening, you know, do you decide about uh, whether or not to do a colonoscopy in an 85-year-old uh, patient? Um, and prognostication is something that internal medicine residents struggle with. Um, and, and so we assign that case when they're with us on geriatrics for the month. And then when I, they're with me in clinic, I refer to the case and, and our faculty who are aware of it. So, so let's talk about what is your ex estimated life expectancy for this patient who's front of us in clinic. So it, it doesn't just live in the aquifer case, it, it comes over. And, and then like, and if they look at me like they don't know what I'm talking about, I say, remember you're supposed to do this case. And then the next time I, they work with me in clinic. So I, I do believe that it's best when there's like that. And I think we saw themes amongst all of us that, that when, aquifer cases are brought into the real world and backwards, um, you know, I think it, it's most effective for teaching clinical skills and making sure that they've actually absorbed it and not just click through an online post. 
Um, any other ways? So, so um, any other ways that guys have done case debriefs? Anyone else want to add any um, other kind of interesting ways people have done case debriefs? I can speak to, you know, we kind of use our debriefs as a way to assess the students on some other skills. So I know there was another question in the chat about what other ways can you assess the students other than soap notes? Um, we also use oral presentations as another outcome, which I think a couple of us um, talked about um, in our presentations as well. But what I'll do is I, I have a background in inpatient medicine. And so one of the things we do is try to prepare our students for inpatient rounds where they're going to be calling consults, they're going to be giving um, quick presentations on rounds. And so we'll have the students work through the case ahead of time, come in to debrief, and I'll call on a group go ahead, call a consult on this patient and kind of, and the students know that they're going to be expected to do that. Um, but they have to then kind of come up with a very quick, succinct, um, several sentence summary of the patient case as if they were like calling a consult. Um, and that's been a really helpful way to assess the students kind of clinical reasoning. Are they able to put together all the key elements of the case and, and be very concise? And not spend you know five minutes droning on and on, but can they be succinct um, in that summary? Yeah, I've heard from other folks that have used that very same thing. Because that um, I like that saying from Blaise Pascal. I'm so sorry this letter to you was so long, but I didn't have time to write you a short one. It's it sounds better in the French probably, but uh, but that, that's when you know that a student has really gotten it right when they can crisply do it. And I think that's where the Oxford cases excel. I think someone had asked earlier about what's the difference between an impression statement and the summary statements. And I really think of the summary statements as being exactly that skill of calling in the console, all the pertinent negatives and positives. And some of the clinical reasoning, I think it might be, I might want this, here's why I'm calling you in to do this. And um, and and so either a handoff similarly to the calling in the console, how would you do the handoff? I think those are really um, quite valuable. Yeah, that's, yeah. and. Um, and you know when a student really knows what they're talking about when they can give it to you crisply. Um, and, and, and that is best done in a feedback, in a live feedback way, rather than in a, than in a written feedback way over aquifer, where they write their thing, but then they see the ideal, um, but there's not a lot of that back and forth uh, that happens naturally in the clinical environment. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here in the Q&A. Um, we've got, uh, what are some other ways and outcomes that you can evaluate after assigning a case other than evaluating a soap note? Have there been other ways that you guys have used to, to evaluate outcomes? I mean, ours is completion of cases, you know, just number of cases they've done, and then the uh, debrief with each individual faculty. But but it's, it's, it's uh, again, with three campuses, you know, it's difficult to standardize that. Anyone else have any thoughts about um, uh, evaluations, high or low states that you guys use for outcomes? Yes, so um, other than the oral presentations that Kelsey already talked about, we do that as well, which we thought we found very helpful um, because we were able to have like very rigid rubric, rubrics like I talked about um, during the presentation and the the faculty members will be are able to do the cases and be familiar with them as well. Um, so that we found is very helpful. And then also um, we do completion of cases as well. Like we we assess for completion of cases. Um, and that I think helps with what I mean, I think you touched on is that, for example, an emergency medicine rotation, I can't guarantee that they're all going to see, you know, acute coronary syndrome. I can't guarantee they're all going to see a PE. So allowing, if I want those in my learning objectives, I can assign these aquifer cases to augment those learning objectives um, in a manner of a way which that, you know, I, I've already done the case and I'm familiar with the cases as well. So I think that that could be very helpful. I had mentioned uh, briefly as well that we use it in a, uh, in, for our electives, which is a, a um, a pharma, pharmacology uh, module um, will assign, you know, they have three electives or three months of electives. So for each month, it's probably about two or three different ologies that, you know, they're going to be best on. And, and we use aquifer cases, you know, like for instance, cardiology. So we'll pick out some pretty relevant ones that we know is, is pretty pharmacologic rich um, and then actually kind of test them. Um, Somewhat on the from the content of that, but also you know other parts of the module that we have them do as well. And to be honest, we've identified that 
um, you know, in our program, and this is probably consistent with a lot of PA programs, that pharmacology is always one thing the students kind of feel like when they're all said and done, it's like, oh, I really don't feel like I feel that comfortable with it. And what we've been finding is that our students have actually um, been feeling a little bit more comfortable and building more familiarity with a lot of the medications that they're seeing out on clinical rotations as well. So it's worked, it's been working pretty well for us. There's actually a great case on that for pharmacology. There, we use a case that's a elderly woman presenting with kind of acute delirium. And they, it's a really, really long med list, which is obviously very common in geriatric patients. And the students have to work through every single medication. Is this a potential cause of delirium? Could this be? And it really, it's a fantastic case to have the students really work on their, their pharmacology knowledge and side effect profile and drug to drug interactions and all of that. I, th I think um, some of the integration of the sciences, the sciences integrations that we're doing with the cases has really helped with a lot of the basic pharmacology knowledge. We have two geriatrics cases, case one and case two. Two is the hypoglycemics one, you know, and sort of like how do these medications work and why is it relevant and knowing that a sulfonylurea has a long half-life, these ones do, and, what, and how that patient can present with delirium, as you mentioned, you know, that, that is really important. And, and the nice thing about it is because all of the basic science is focused around a, a real patient. It, it's not like this random basic science knowledge. And, and it allows students to build that framework of knowledge when you teach them back to the basics, which um, even, even MD students who have theoretically learned all of this over two years of basic science or a year and a half of basic science, that you forget because it was just so much and you didn't have it connected to a patient. And I, and I think that's a really nice um, enhancement that's coming here. We've already started working on that in the aquifer cases that, that I'm very excited about is that return back to basic sciences. And um, you know, one of the questions that came by, by email was, um, how do you teach basic clinical skills to even early preclinical learners? And, and, and though that may not be what aquifer has been created for, we have found it to be helpful too in some situations. So I mentioned like the early preclinical learners with advanced directives and some communication skills, breaking bad news. We've used uh, some of the cases in that way. Um, but even vital signs, like basic taking vital signs, we have a whole aquifer geriatric case that talks about vital signs and how they can lie to you or be really good in geriatric patients. So, um, so case uh, number 17, this is Mahmoud who has a pneumonia from a nursing home. The fact that she doesn't have a fever is actually quite typical, but a student may not know that. And she doesn't have a fever, so she doesn't have an infection. Or we just added a bit on a pulse oximetry in a darker skin individual and teaching how pulse oximetry can be inaccurate when, when patients um, uh, have a darker skin, for example. So there are some of these basic things about just the importance of vital signs that if you're teaching vital signs to a student, at least that beginning part of the case would be like, wow, this vital sign, vitals are vital. And I now I know why. And actually understanding the nuances of respiratory rate and pulse ox and blood pressure can be really important. So there are a lot of aquifer cases that though the later parts of them, the what antibiotic should I do in nursing home according to acquired pneumonia might be above the head of a, very early preclinical student, it would be totally appropriate um, to sit, hit pause and then say, we're going to pick this case up in six months or 12 months after you've had infectious disease or whatever. And, and, and it could be really fun. And they'd be like, hey, remember Mrs. Mahmoud? Well, here we go. Now you're ready to, to take care of her abnormal um, presentation. I mean, I think that's a really good point you made. I think as to look at uh, Aquifer as a wonderful faculty resource as well, and you can incorporate it into your didactic teaching to start teaching those basic clinical reasoning skills. Um, you know, I, when we first started, or I start, first started learning, uh, learning and then teaching with Aquifer, just using bits and pieces of each case um, can really help with those basic skills in the very beginning and didactic, you know, during didactic lecturing and whatnot. Yeah, off of that. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Kelsey. I was just going to say, we, we sometimes even take the medical part of the medical knowledge part even out of the case. So there's one case where the patient comes in with a lot of different complaints and we use the case to talk about visit prioritization and setting an agenda. And so we even take the medical knowledge stuff out of it. How do you even, you have 15 minutes with this patient. Let's talk through the skill set of how do you prioritize a multi-visit, you know, or multiple complaint visit. Um, so I think even using bits and pieces of the cases like you talked about, Shannon, can be really helpful. And, and I was going to kind of remind everyone of the educator resources that are available too. I found the pediatrics one, the toolkits, 
Um, you know, the, the case analysis and the active learning modules were really wonderful to, you know, kind of implement some of Aquifer into your classes without you having to, you know, kind of spend a lot of time putting things together, right? It's already there for you. Um, that and, and the, the social determinants of health series, um, I use quite often in, in one of our courses. I'll kind of give them that, that initial framework that, you know, Mitt was kind of alluding to in, the, in their didactic years and such too, and then remind them again in the clinical years, so. Another question that we got by email was about um, uh, how can you do a little bit more of the hybrid teaching or Zoom video, et cetera, and maybe with more advanced learners. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about how we use it with residents. We've also used um, Aquifer with fellows as a boot camp, for example. Um, uh, have, have any had any experience of uh, using it with, uh, with let's say, a entry level PA or a um, or or doing uh, things in in a hybrid fashion? Either of those two questions. So I I don't I. I've never used it with actual uh, entry-level PAs. I don't know if Kelsey and Peter have either, um, but I have used, you know, we use it throughout the clinical year, even at the very end when, you know, they're about to graduate and be entry-level PAs. Um, and I think one of the ways that we have done this is with when we were fully on Zoom or remote is through our virtual rounds and using it as kind of like faculty-led virtual rounds. Um, and that takes a little, higher level um, thinking as far as the students doing the different cases, coming together, discussing those cases, which was very helpful, obviously, when we had to go on a brief pause from rotation during COVID, but then also it's just as I were like, you know, remote syllabi, if the students ever have to, you know, it's changing so much, but if the students ever have to quarantine whatnot, it's in that curriculum that we have as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great idea. I, I haven't had experience with having to kind of use it for, you know, um, um, graduates or so who are preparing for pants or anything. But um, I know I've used it for myself for kind of preparing for, for pants in, in addition to preparing for lectures and such too, you know, going through some of the aquifer cases and picking out what are some of the finer points that I really should be honing in on and just, you know, and just gathering back. Oh, yeah, I remember about that too. So, yeah. One strategy we've used to teach uh, uh, clinical skills, teach quote unquote te clinical skills, is to use a teach the teacher model. So it's not offensive. So to the fellows, we say we're going to expect you, or to the uh, to let's say a practicing PAs who are going to have PA students with them or something. We know you know this, but here's some teaching scripts that you can learn. You do these cases, go into the deep dives, so that you understand how people teach it. And and in de facto it becomes like a refreshing of the memory of people, right? Um, and so especially for our fellows and when we use it for boot camps and, and people nationally have done that, that's become very helpful. And also I think we use it a little bit more often for geriatrics for that because a lot of times people don't have as much geriatrics um, exposure in their NPPA, MDDO programs. And so they don't have much. And so it's not as like, oh my gosh, you're giving me a, something built for, for clinical students, you know, medical students, PA students or NP students. They, they, and, and if they feel like it's basic, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be teaching this. And so it, it kind of just flips the script just a little bit. And we know that all of us, that there's no better way to learn something than by teaching it or thinking that you might have to teach it. And so that's been just a little bit of a, 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 a slight shift in how when we give the assignment that has completely changed the way that people think about it a little bit. Um, and so I'm going to have to teach this. So, um, so some just really nice things. Uh, um, I think we answered all of the questions that I've seen here that's come up in the in the, the chatter Q and A box. So I don't know if anyone has any last uh, concluding things that they'd like to say. Um, Shannon, Kelsey, or, or Peter. Just that it's been an invaluable resource for us. I mean, doing this big curricular revision and not having to spend you know, years writing all new cases, like just having these robust um, cases that are very lifelike and very real already finished um, and ready to go has just been invaluable. So 
really encourage people to use it. <laughs> Don't reinvent the wheel. It's a wonderful faculty resource. I mean, it's just amazing. And for not just new faculty, but people that have been in education for a very long time as well. These are amazing cases, very well written. You, you don't have to write your own case and then vet it after a few years. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a great faculty resource. Great. And I'm a student affairs dean, so I love that students don't complain about it. You know, I'm so used to that side of things. And so, so it's always nice when you add things to a curriculum and you hear crickets. Um, and it's be, and that means you've dialed it right. You, 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 you've, you've made it lifelike learning and they feel like they're getting something out of it. And, you know, the average score, I think, is 4.6 or something out of a 5.5 star scale and, you know, uh, across all aqua flow cases. And that's that's really nice to see. Um, when students say that they got value out of their learning. And I think that that, that helps. And, and, and I think that just happens because they're so iterative and they've been around for so long and keep getting better and better and reviewed every year. That really helps them a lot. So I encourage you guys to, to use them to teach clinical skills. Um, uh, if you have great ideas, send them along, add to the teacher's guide. Uh, we're a community of educators in the end. And, and um, a lot of the great ideas for aquifer and use of aquifer have developed over the years by our users of the cases who have told us, hey, we would love this, or this would be great. Could you put us together a table of the clerkships that you would assign a case? You know, all those things for us uh, you know, really came about from uh, requests from, from the people who are in the, in the trenches teaching and using it. So it was wonderful to have everybody join today um, and hopefully this was useful and uh, we'll, uh, we're out of time. So we'll wrap. <laughs> See y'all. Thanks, everybody.